She is on the Mount Rushmore of Seattle sports media. She has and continues to work with the Washington Huskies, sideline reporting, ESPN calling games, Pac-12 network. The list goes on. And we're so glad to have her here to go over her career and what she's accomplished so far. It's Elise Woodward on Twitter at Elise M. Woodward. I'm on Twitter at Brian Fenley. I'm an anchor at Fox Sports Radio. Elise, first of all, I'm really grateful to have the opportunity to chat and kind of run through your career. I find that we, not during these times, usually have a chance to talk, but given the circumstances, it's it's trying to make the best of what we have. And I look at you, at least, as someone who's been a pioneer in allowing more women to, to find themselves into sports media. When you yourself were making that a sense, when did you find yourself having to fight the hardest for the respect that you deserved? Um, you know, it's funny. I, I use the word pioneer, and I'm like, man, I'm getting real old. <laughs> um, which is all good, because, you know, the truth hurts, right? But um, I feel like because of my background and being an athlete that you're heckled by the crowd. I had really demanding coaches growing up. I mean, really demanding coaches. Um, I mean, my first name, I, I giggle used to be like a swear word and, and then it was my last name. God, you know, get over here. Just, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I I've been very used to, um, I don't know, just fighting for everything that I've had and tough and being tough and thick skinned since I was little. I held an older brother that was six years older than me that played football at Oregon that, I mean, he showed no mercy to me. And then I had an older sister who was like mentally like in my stuff. So I had to figure out quickly just how to be tough. And so I've never really felt like, um, I don't know. I just have approached my job. Everybody seems so much nicer than my siblings growing up. So I haven't really felt like I've had like some difficulties. I felt like, you know, for the most part, and I, I think I just ignore if I'm not, I, I don't, I just try to push through it. If so, I may not have it like stored in my brain of having to overcome these big things. I just have gone and done it. If, and you played basketball at Washington if you were to call one of your own games, which one would it be? Oh gosh, that's a great question. You know, I have one, I have a lot of vivid memories. The worst one is the one that stands out of my mind. Um, so we'll just gloss over that. Cause sure. you know, <laughs> but um, you know, that's a great question. Um, you had a lot of great games playing in the NCAA tournament. Yeah, you know, it's funny. My teammates and I, we talk about it all the time. Like, specific games don't really stick out in my mind as much as moments in, in with the team and on the bus and traveling and in the locker room and training. I mean, I felt like we trained and practiced and did so many more things than we ever spent on the court. Mm -hmm. But those are fleeting. I know there was a game – that we had to win down in the LA's my senior year and that we won it. And it, we felt like if we'd won that we would get to the NCAA tournament when I was a senior and we did. Um, uh, and that was the weekend against uh, UCLA. Um, but gosh, it's, it's been so long. I don't even remember to be honest, like they all just kind of blend together. <laughs> now let's, let's take it this way. You calling a game, of all of them you've called, it could be basketball or anything, which one did you like the best in terms of your handling of a crunch time situation? Like you liked the, a five minute span at the end where you said, I nailed it. Whether it was your inflection, the words you used, your energy level, it all sort of came together for you in a really tight finish of a ball game. You know, I always think that the best broadcasts are when there's something compelling and sometimes you nail a broadcast but because the game is choppy with turnovers or missed shots I mean you could be just calling it like the defense here is going to cause this turnover but you never feel good like the the flow of it I think for me personally unless it's a really compelling game or like a really high moment um I mean, when Kelsey Plum scored 57 points to become the all-time leading scorer, 
that one is seared in my mind just because it was such a cool moment to be a part of, to break the all time scoring record and to do it with 57 points on senior night, your last home game of the regular season as a senior. I just thought that was so epic. And knowing that she needed 53 points that game to get it done. And I said, prepare. I go to the whole broadcast crew. I said, don't put a pastor. And everybody's like, nah, she can't get it tonight. She'll do it to the factory tournament. And she did it. So I, that one, you know, is singed in my mind. Um, there's been so many cool games I've been a part of. For whatever reason, I go back to when I was a sideline reporter with the Sonics. And I remember there was a pick and roll situation and they were playing the Lakers and Vladi Divots. And um, he kept sagging on the pick and roll and the Sonics were just killing him with it. And so they finally came to me and I set it up and I had Nate McMillan out of the timeout. And I just, I saw it. And then Nate, what I saw was talking about it in the timeout. And then I was able to explain it. And and that was early in my career. Obviously, the Sonics has been gone for quite some time. But I just, I remember after that, just being like, that was awesome. Like, we got that. And the coach backed up what I was saying. And anyway, that kind of random, but it, I still remember that and, and being excited about it. I love it. We're talking with Elise Woodward, who dominates in Seattle sports and beyond. I'm Brian Fenley. Elise is on Twitter at Elise M. Woodward. I'm on Twitter at Brian Fenley. Taking it in that direction of your history interviewing, whether it was with the Sonics or the Huskies or beyond, what was an interview that you did where it was hardest on you because it was after a tough loss and it almost felt like you had to console the interviewee. It was just, you were that, everybody was that emotionally <laughs> invested and it was that heartbreaking. You know, there's no question that I'm a Southern reporter for Husky football and I've been doing it for years and years and the season that they went 0 and 12 and there was a game that was the apple cup. It wasn't the final game of the season. Like it normally is in the rivalry game, but it was the next to last game of the season. And the Huskies had not won a game all year. Jake Locker got hurt and Wazoo had only won one. No, maybe Wazoo, they were really struggling too. They called it the toilet bowl before the game <laughs> started. Like it was just yeah, epically yeah. bad. And the Huskies lost this game. And they were actually favored this game. And they lost this game in Pullman. And I remember doing the post-game interviews in the weight room at um, inside like Beasley. It was across this, like across the section from this football field. And the players being so despondent, like this was the 10th game in a row. We talked about them losing. And then to make it worse, it was to their rival who they were supposed to beat. And it was a gross game, like 16 to 13. And both teams were terrible. And I remember talking to, I won't name the kid, but I remember talking to him and he was a good, solid Husky that had started for you know quite a few years. And and there's just nothing you can say and you just are like oh and then the following weekend the huskies played at cal and they just got absolutely smoked and tyrone willingham we were supposed to talk to him after the game and he was like trying to get away from the media and he didn't want to talk and it was just it just was one of those you're like this is so painful for everybody involved and those kind of stick out if you could give yourself an emmy for how you handled a broadcast during a technical difficulty, is there one that comes to mind where things did not go exactly as planned and it was to no fault of your own or to no fault of, of the broadcast? It just things happen when you do it. And you had to come in and ad lib certain things that you were very proud in which you handled it. Oh, gosh, that's a tough one. Um... I remember one game when I was the analyst with the Seattle Storm years and years ago. Mm -hmm. This was on the radio with David Locke, who's now the play-by-play -play voice for the Utah Jazz. And we were in Houston. And the phone lines, when the connection for us at the time were phone lines for the radio broadcast. And they just disappeared. They went down. And we had no way, in the middle of the broadcast, and it was a big broadcast. It was against the defending world champs. It was the Houston Comets. And it was this big game. and. The phone lines went down 
and we were sitting there like going, we have to get on the air. How are we going to get on the air? Yeah. And so we literally took the old school dial up phone and we shared the receiver to call the game. And when he handed it to me, I'd give my analysis and he would go back and do the play by play call. And I love David. And once in a while, I, I kind of remember being like, all right, hand it over. All right, let's go. It's my turn. Like I got to explain this one. And I remember that. And then we finally got hooked back up at somehow some way later in the game. But yeah, it was complete and total scramble mode. It, and you two both did a lot of radio together mm -hmm. years ago. And then at one point, if I'm not mistaken, Elise, you had your own show and it was Elise at night. How did you feel like you conveyed yourself on the air and how did that change over the course of that show and the, the perception of yourself that you were trying to give off in order to elicit, you know, reactions from sports fans, because certainly that's always compelling sports radio. Yeah, you know, I think that's the hardest thing, honestly, for for me in sports radio, because I generally, I'm a nice person. Yeah. And it's really hard because so many people in that forum, it's very negative. And so me being nice and not wanting, I don't want to call for somebody's head just to do it. And a lot of people, I mean, there, there are idiots right now calling for Pete Carroll's head. Like, what? I just have no time for that. It, it That part was just really got to me that like, I don't want to ever be that person that is negative and not being truthful. And I wouldn't be truthful if I said, yeah, he should be fired every time. I mean, we're talking, there'll be random games in a season. Yeah. You're, it was a stinky game. That was a terrible, the Seahawks just had a terrible loss to the Rams in the playoffs. That doesn't mean he should be fired. That's like a, it's just, to me, that was the hardest part about sports radio was um, trying to maintain your personality and being fair and honest and open with what really is going on when there's a lot of different forces that want to push you towards negativity. What was a sports take or a monologue that you had where you felt almost out of character? There was an issue that you did have a, a significant emotional reaction to that you recall when you were doing your show on the radio, whether it was something... Seahawks or Sonics or beyond where you really wanted to make a statement and it didn't have to be like a hot take it didn't have to be necessarily something that was mean to somebody else like calling for somebody's job but you took a stand and you were confident in what you said and you were very pleased with how you kind of handled yourself during that. Well I think the one show and it's probably the most hollow that I've ever felt as a sports fan and I I was vested in so many ways one I've been a basketball fan since I remember it was the first sport that I really fell in love with although I played multiple sports um my first you know sports hero was Kareem Abdul-Jabbar I just loved him I loved watching the Lakers I would do projects on him at school and all this stuff the day that the Sonics and, and as somebody that worked for the Sonics and also worked for the Storm and then worked sports radio, there was so many tie-ins. But ultimately in my heart, I'm a huge basketball fan. And I understood, I did so many stories about that left shrimp and the millions of dollars is donated in the community. And Rashard Lewis giving away things to the Ronald McDonald house. And, and I've, I knew these players on, I mean, not, you know, I'm not even going to try to claim that we're locker partners and best friends. I'm just saying that, you know, I, I felt like I had more of an insight about how they truly were than a lot of fans that just watched them play basketball. And I knew there were some great dudes. And when the Sonics left and I was at the city council meeting, when they came out with smiles on their faces and said, oh yeah, we got this deal. Mind you, I had been to the courts. I had followed the trials. I had, I was still, it, it just, it still is mind boggling to me that we're sitting here and there is not professional basketball on the men's side in Seattle. Um, anyway, I did the show. My show at that time was, and I kind of did a show in just about every time slot on the radio. My show at that time immediately followed the news and I was the one that was on the air. I went straight from the courthouse or to the city council venue, wherever it was. It was downtown Seattle, I remember. And 
I went straight to do that show and the angry and the venom and the vitriol and the, just being despondent. That's something I will, it's seared in my mind. I still, to this day, have it seared in my mind. And we used to do a show with Howard Schultz. His son was an intern on our show. Oh, wow. And for him to make that decision, the, I just, to me, to this day, I, I'm still appalled. I, I'm still appalled. But, you know, I had to do that show three hours that night and it was as raw as it gets, that's for sure. It was, I could probably still go off. <laughs> Every, I, all my friends have heard it. My kids have heard it. I just, I want the Sonics back so badly and I'm so passionate about it. And I pulled my kids out of school back in 2013 when the Sacramento Kings were supposed to be sold. Like it was like, and then that didn't happen either. Like it's been, I just, I'm hoping that with the crack in and with the climate change arena and with the recent statements that, uh, that professional basketball on the men's side will come back. I mean, I've got two kids that are, you know, my oldest boy is 17 and I have a 15 year old and they don't even remember going to the Sonic games. I used to take them all the time. They don't even remember they were five and three. They were five and three when the Sonics left. We got a little, you know, Ray Allen jersey around that's still in the closet and the Richard Lewis and the, you know, whatever. It's just uh, Gary Payton. But anyway, it's, uh, that is one monologue I'll never forget, yeah. The rumblings that you've heard recently of the Sonics and the potential that they could return from some of the statements, how much confidence does that give you that within the next five or so, maybe less or maybe more, that we could see that team back? Oh. Please don't say five years. I mean, just give me five minutes. I mean, everybody's <laughs> ready here. They're going to open up the arena next year. And I, my hope is that, honestly, that it's quick. And that, um, you know, because of the COVID financial hits with the NBA and what an expansion franchise or two, because Vegas has been mentioned as well, what that could do that I think that there is definitely good hope, um, possibility, I mean, it, it's painful. I, I I mean, it's just painful not having a team up here in uh, Seattle. And, you know, I go back where I used to cover Vancouver, too, where we would go back and forth for the Vancouver, Seattle. I mean, you know, they're only people that aren't from here don't realize Vancouver's only two and a half hour drive. I mean, it's right there. You cross the border. You're there in Vancouver. It's awesome. Um, and that was a fun, you know, burgeoning rivalry. And then that, they got taken away too. They're in Memphis. So anyway, it's, um, yeah, it's something that I feel very good is going to happen because financially it, it makes way too much sense. And it was a great franchise that had tremendous fan support. And if you look at any sport in Seattle, any sport, mm. male or female, they have tremendous this. Seahawk fans are nuts. The Storm fans are called the Storm Crazies. They get tremendous support. The Mariner fans, God bless the Mariner fans. They still show up and they're still passionate. And that team hasn't made the playoffs since, what, 2002. Um, it's unbelievable how long it's been. Um, speaking of my kids, they haven't made the playoffs since my kids were born. And we're a huge <laughs> baseball family. But the fans still show up. And the University of Washington Husky fans are crazy and loud. Um, and so anyway, there's just, and obviously the Sounders, there's just so many great fans and passionate, they're passionate sports fans here in the Seattle area. And they certainly were with the Sonics and, you know, it, we could go on and on about why the Sonics left, but it was not for the lack of fan support. Uh, it, it, that just wasn't the, it wasn't the case like so many franchises when they move are. It was kind of like the old school Cleveland Browns when they lost. Um, it wasn't for the lack of passion of the fan support. So um, hopefully. I'm, I'm, you know, my kid goes to college after a year, he's a junior. And I'm like, I just love to have the MBA before he goes to college, but it's, it's probably at this point, that's a real long shot, but I'm still hopeful. It's going to come. We're talking with Elise Woodward. And my final question for you, we, we might not have the NBA in Seattle, but we do have the WNBA yes. and you've been a really important part of the broadcast team for the storm. And they've been, outstanding lately right they won the WNBA championship this past season and what was it like to watch that and how they did it in a bubble and then how you hosted like the championship ceremony virtually and how the specifics of all that worked out yeah that was I was sitting just 
I actually hosted the parade and the championship, you know, the virtual parade, I guess is what you called it, from my kid's bedroom. It, <laughs> I mean, it's just so surreal and weird, but I was thrilled that they were able to put together the, the wobble and for those athletes to get a chance. I mean, it's so fleeting and on the outside looking in, you know, you can just think it's year after year, but in each individual's career, one year is a massive thing. Most people don't have a 10 year career. Think about that. That's a long professional career. You take one year out of a 10 year career, that's 10% gone. So, and in their prime. And then you consider someone like Sue Bird, who, yeah, she's been lucky. She's had double a 10 year career, right? She's phenomenal. But was this going to be her last season? We don't know. But I mean, all indications that she's going to be back and she's healthy, but you can't take that for granted when you're nearly 40 years old and they were good enough to win it. And I was so thrilled that they were able to go to the Wubble and to have Brianna Stewart come back and to have her Achilles healed and ready. And it was just, and then everything they did from the social justice standpoint and how they were able to, you know, they have said that they were a huge part in leading you know, a voice for social justice. And no matter what side of the aisle you're on politically, I would hope that everybody is for equal rights. Yeah. And that is what they fought for this summer. And it was, it was really inspiring. And I think for them now looking back in the change too, that was really cool. So, you know, I'm super proud to be um, a part of the Storm franchise and have called so many championships. And um, I mean, they're, they got to be the defending, the, they're the defending champs. They got to be the favorite to do it again, I think. So I, I'm just hoping and praying that they get a chance to do it in front of their own fans this year, because instead of broadcasting, I, I'm always a fan, but instead of broadcasting, I was hundred percent of a fan and, and that was cool, but it's a whole lot better to be in the arena with fans and Doppler and the mascot and all that stuff. Like all fans and broadcasters know it's like, it's a huge part of, our lives right now that it's missing and it, it's um i'm just praying we can get back to that as soon as we can no question i know you're praying that the sonics come back to seattle as soon as they can and when they do i can't wait to see the humongous smile on your face and you're going to take your kids and you're going to be like you guys remember remember what this was like well, oh. we're going to make new memories now it's time <laughs> yeah i mean there's i it's so crazy it, I just, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. My fingers are crossed. I think that the city is set up to do it now for so long. We just didn't have an arena and um, now we do, which that was the whole thing was the arena and Chris Hansen bless his heart. I don't know how much he followed it, but he is a hedge fund gazillionaire that was going to put up his own money and build it and put a lot of pressure on the city to that. They finally were like, no, we, we've got to build this arena. We've got to use the former key arena. He didn't get it done, and I'm sorry for that because he is a huge fan and put his money where his mouth would, was and donated time and money and resources and all that. Um, but it did get the ball rolling to get the Sonics back, and so I'm hoping that that's soon. No hoping. question. Elise Woodward, find her all over the airwaves. Whatever. Well, let's hope. It's been slow with COVID, man. It's like it was all good, and then it's cancel, 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 and – you know, like everything right now, it's like literally by the day. Like, it's literally don't by the day. And you know what? It's not going to last forever, knock on wood. And one day we'll be able to have those fans back and you'll be able to celebrate those storm championships with everybody around you. And then you'll get the Sonics and it'll be great. But no question. But we can't wait until that next broadcast. because We can't wait to see you up there again because... It must be challenging to have to sit it out a little while and kind of wait through some of these COVID-19 issues. But you're so talented, Elise, and thanks so much for, for some of your time. Enjoyed kind of digging back into your career, looking at the Sonics and getting to know more about you and your story and what made you become the person, the broadcaster you are today. I'm Brian Fenley. Thanks so much again. Really appreciate you. Oh, yeah. No, anytime. It was, uh, it was my pleasure, Brian.